<laughs> oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Forster is here. Yeah, thank you so much for being here at today's SAG After Foundation screening of what they had and from what they had to what we had, what we now have this moment with this guy, Robert Forster, one of my all time faves, one of yours too. And first of all, you know, you and I have sort of made this round a little bit uh, for the last couple of months. Uh, what is it about this film that makes you just so proud of everything, not just your work, but working with everyone else, Elizabeth Chomko, everyone? Um, can, I, can people hear me or do I need to do this? You need that. <laughs> They're filming it. I will use this. <laughs> um, you know, it's, a, um, it's an old-fashioned movie. It's the kind of movie I grew up with. Uh, it, uh, you, f you fall into it, the next thing you know, you're in the story. It is a movie that, um, unlike a lot of movies, uh, does not ex ask you to cry, but makes you cry. I saw it, uh, the second time I saw it, I felt a, a tear going down my side. I said, wow, Bob, you even know the story. You know this thing. <laughs> and it is and it is making, and it's giving you uh, emotion. So I know that it does to, uh, to real audiences who have never seen it before. It is a beautifully written movie from a young woman who, this is her first movie and her first job of direction, Elizabeth Chomko. Um, it was, yeah. I'm with you. It was fabulous on the page. Uh, start with that. Well, Elizabeth, you know, what was it about her, you know, first discussions with her about the story, about Bert, that resonated with you? We had a uh, dinner uh, the night before we started shooting. Uh, this was a, this is a tiny movie. Uh, this was a 20-day shoot in Chicago. Uh, two extra days or a day and a half here in L.A. shooting uh, the stuff at the end that uh, that where the um, the home is, where the mother is, where the turkey comes. Uh, so uh, this is a tiny movie, and it was shot. It almost didn't start because uh, I think some, f uh, as, as very often happens, uh, it might have been the financing, but whatever it was, we were delayed for a few days. I got this late, as very often happens. You hear actors talk about receiving scripts that have uh, other actors' fingerprints on them. <laughs> They don't send you the script anymore. You get it by email. So you don't know whose fingerprints actually are on it. But you do know when you get it very late that it is uh, that you are uh, uh, coming late to the game. Uh, but I had a conversation with her at dinner the night before we were going to shoot. Um, and uh, maybe it was two nights because the very night before all the other actors had arrived, I arrived one day extra early. And um, it didn't take much conversation. Uh, I, knew what, uh, I knew what it was when I read it. And, uh, you know, just not to use foul language, but I knew that the jackass on the page was me. <laughs> and it was not no at all hard, no <laughs> offense and it was not at all uh, hard to fathom what this required well what is it uh, when you look at at your career you know what is it where does Bert uh, your character where does he rank in your career oh right at the top wow uh, I've gotten lucky several times listen I feel like that guy that fell out of the 40th story window bounced off an awning and landed in a truck full of mattresses they used to say that there was a punchline some actor uh, was that lucky well I am that lucky in the very beginning of my career um, I uh, my father an elephant trainer on the Ringling Circus during the 1930s just before I was born uh, did not and afraid of nothing this guy did not miss a beat when i went to him and said dad i don't think i want to try to be an attorney a lawyer i think i want to be an actor he didn't miss a beat he said i think you can do that bob and so without knowing that there are this many of us and this many jobs i merrily went to new york city and uh, and uh, and got very lucky. My first job was a bit in the New York City subway system on a James Garner movie called Mr. Budwing. Uh, thereafter, I met a, an actress who wanted to uh, 
uh, a, 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 have a scene partner. I did the scene for the class. She asked me to do it for an agent. We did it for an agent. The agent said, are you represented? I said, no, I'm not. He said, I want to send you on an interview. I got the interview. I got the job. I'm on Broadway in 1965 in a two-character play, Mrs. Daly has a lover. This qualifies as lucky. But the picture that I got from John Houston when I met him and told him I had never made a movie and I and I hadn't uh, I said I did uh, one Broadway play I wasn't bad but I don't make myself an actor I never did a movie I don't know how they're made uh, I don't know what the tricks are but if you hire me I will give you your money's worth and he believed me <laughs> and uh, and gave me reflections in a golden eye this qualifies as, as gigantic luck and uh, then after my career had peaked uh, after a few years and uh, started to decline. It didn't stop declining for 27 years. <laughs> and, uh, and I was sitting on a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a coffee shop on, on Santa Monica Boulevard and in walks Quentin Tarantino. And I had uh, auditioned for him uh, five years prior for uh, Reservoir Dogs. And I yelled at him and he came over and sat down. We blah blah for a while and I asked him what he was doing. He said he was doing an adaptation of Rum Punch Elmore Leonard novel, he said, why don't you read it? And I did. And six months after that, I walked into that same restaurant where I walk every day. I got to have a spot. And he was sitting in my seat. And as I approached the table, he lifted up this script and handed it to me and said, uh, uh, read this, see if you like it. That qualifies as really lucky. After 30 years, that was after 30 years after my first period. And 20 years ago, that was. But there is nothing since those three probably and maybe the descendants where uh, Alexander Payne gave me one of the great uh, and if I ever have an in memoriam one of these days that punch in the nose will probably be the thing that they uh, they, <laughs> they hang on <laughs> to you know uh, there's only a few things in in a career that are uh, that good but this is without question the best uh, part I have ever had and uh, she wrote it, and it is, uh, you know, flawless. Um, and, and I remind actors who are looking for a scene to do in their class, try doing the scene where I tell my children that I am the best uh, uh, memory care. Uh, this will tell you, this will let you feel what it, likes, what it is like to, to stand up for someone you love. It is a fabulous scene, and the words in this were fabulous. So this qualifies as one of my, uh, certainly at this point in my career, uh, after 53 years, uh, qualifies as a, a gigantic uh, uh, lucky break for me. Okay, just so you know, you answered eight of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is worthless to me now. All that work, all that research. Oh, <laughs> no. Um, you know, but but it is you know it is what twenty days in, in Chicago. I think maybe shot a couple, uh, or or she shot a couple in L.A. But I mean, what a what a what an amazing cast! And you know, for Bly Danner, who I I believe you'd worked with before, to work with her again, especially you know for her to play someone with all, Alzheimer's, the research that she must have done. You know, what was it like to not just to work with her, but but to, to work with her on a role like this, where it's uh it's something that you know a lot of people can can connect with she claimed that she was unprepared she claimed that she didn't know enough to do this she claimed that um, that she uh, was worried and afraid and yet on a daily basis made great choices uh, delivered a character that we all understood and cared for and uh, identified with and um, she was wonderful she was wonderful to work with um, and uh, and uh, and and what? Oh God! I have a good story about an acting lesson I got from a painter, which reminds me that on her first day she did great stuff. But I was sitting in the in a um, a painter's studio one time. This was long, many years ago. He's now passed, but um, he uh, he took a canvas and put that white stuff on it. Uh, uh, gesso. He gessoed this, and he sat it in front of a fan so that it would dry in a hurry. He had no patience, and eventually he put it up on an easel and he grabbed one of his long brushes, little tight uh, bristles, and he broke through a glob of oil paint that was on a piece of glass, and then he squirted some more 
So he had two colors on that brush, and he stood in front of the easel for a long time before he finally took a line from the upper right-hand corner and went all the way down a diagonally and close to the end, he did zzz, 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 like that. And I remind actors what a lesson it was for me. I remind actors that on the first day, your first stroke has got to be strong and secure and has got to include the details because you will never address that stroke again. She, for her part, addressed that first day, and I don't remember what her first thing was. Um, it might have been something simple, but whatever it was, it contained the details that she then built upon in for the rest of the movie. She was a real person and a real character and, uh, and gave it her all, even though she claimed to be unprepared to start. And that is what uh, actors do on the first day. They are unprepared to start, but got to start anyway. And you, they have to deliver a strong and confident stroke and include the detail that will be there because you will never address that stroke again. Master class, ladies and gentlemen. feels like one of the things that really lends the authenticity of this family is that you, the simplicity of, of the production, you know, and uh, just, just sort of like being in the house together, all of you together, uh, you know, having some, some time to prep and to get to know each other a little. I mean, obviously, you know, Blythe, but, but Hillary and, and Michael Shannon and, and just uh, like, like how did you start to feel the rhythm of the fine, of the family dynamic that we wind up seeing on the big screen actors these we're all actors yes pretty close well actors do what actors do they arrive on a set they do not know the other people very often you don't know who is who's who and you must achieve immediate intimacy mm -hmm. and do that's the actor's job you uh, you uh, immediately find uh, the the intimacy that you know is in the script that you've got to uh, uh, grab hold of and do. Um, we also had a tight shooting schedule and we shot in one location, that house. We shot in uh, that house for, I don't know, for most of the schedule. And, um, and uh, when we were not working in a room, those of us who weren't in the shot moved to the, one of the unused bedrooms. And when they wanted to use that room, we moved out of there and moved into someplace else in the house. So it was a flow of actors moving around so that they could shoot uh, wherever uh, the shot had to be. Elizabeth Chomko, the screenwriter, director, she just uh, found out that about 20 minutes ago won a Humanitize Prize for her screenplay. She was nominated for that. Nominated. She, yes. Okay. She, that, that will be announced eventually, uh, but she was nominated and for that's it. That's a great, I mean, that's a bravo to Elizabeth Chomko. But with all the filmmakers and the directors you worked with over the years, what was it about Elizabeth that made her like a, a great actor's director? She did what the real, real good directors do, and she did for us. Uh, she made the actors feel that the material they were saying were their, they were the authors of. She has a grace, and that grace allows the actor, and she wrote it. It's not like you make it up. It's not like uh, I, I made my stuff up. Uh, you know, at the tails and, 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 and heads and tails of a shot, maybe you say a couple of things that are improvisational, or maybe at the end of the shot when uh, the words are over with, you keep on talking for those little things, of course, are, uh, are sometimes meaningful and helpful, and sometimes they make the movie. They get into the movie. But um, in general, she gave the actors the belief or the feeling that they were the authors of the material that they were saying. So she has a particular grace. Sometimes in when you do television, you know, those words have been okayed from the top of the studio down through everybody. You dare not change a syllable because if you do, somebody comes over to you and says, uh, hey, look, it's written like this. Come on. And uh, But in a movie, uh, oh, so much better. And with it, when the person who has written the movie is directing the movie, and that included Tarantino and Alexander Payne, and even John Huston at the very beginning. You didn't have to go to somebody and say, I wonder what he meant. You say, what did you mean? And, uh, or if you need to say that. And so working with a writer-director is, uh, is always uh, helpful and easier. Uh, in what ways did this role and this film challenge you that, uh, compared to your previous movies? Boy, I don't think there's ever been a movie that was easier for me. 
as I say, it, uh, it, it felt like uh, who I am. Um, you know, I've got four kids. I have, uh, and I've been uh, slugging it out for as all of us have, for as long as you have. Uh, and, uh, and it's, um, what was the question? <laughs> Uh, how did this movie comes with age? You? I'm pr- I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> challenge you? How, like what ways did the movie challenge you? But it sounds like it was uh, it was so tailored for you that it was it was, it was easy. yes. It seemed to be easy for me. It seemed to be easy for me. It is. Uh, I, I was having a conversation a few nights ago with Alexander Payne, who I don't see very often, but happen to see him, and um, and the subject came up, and I reminded him that. It doesn't matter whether the movie is good or bad. The movie hasn't, on a daily basis, the actor doesn't go in there to shoot a movie. The actor goes in there to shoot a, a, a small, finite number of shots. Each of these shots is like a magic trick. You must learn the words. You must start out by knowing those words so well they can come out of your mouth the way thoughts come out of your mouth, not the way lines come out of your mouth. You must learn the root of whatever the shot is. Maybe you've got to make an exit or an entrance, and maybe you've got to move some props around or say something to somebody else. You've got to find out what the director needs of you so that you can deliver that when you hear action. And that isn't the end of it, of course. The one who set the lights wants you to be in it. And the one listening for the words got to hear them correctly. Otherwise, at the end of the shot, somebody says, no good for sound, start again. Or if you put the cup in the wrong spot, somebody says, no good for continuity, start again. Or if you do something too big for the shot you're in, somebody says, no good for composition, start again. You, got, uh, you owe something to everybody on that set, including the other actor who may have to do this emotionally in a scene, for whom you got to build a little ramp so the other actor can do this emotionally in a scene. And for yourself, you want your stuff to fall as simple as physics requires no more no less real authentic believable actions honest truthful actions and for the one who is cutting this movie together you got to know the downs and the ups of the roller coaster track which we are trying to get our audience into a car to take that ride and you got to be able to contribute to those downs and the ups and going around the curves if you're not believable your audience won't be with you at the end of the ride and for the person who hired you you owe them to help get those 18 or 15 or 25 shots that day because you got to help them get their schedule done and if you do uh, you've done your job. It is, uh, and, and, and as I remind people, uh, actors I know do that eight days a week. It is not that hard to create an action which advantages more than just yourself. And, uh, and so uh, 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 actors uh, do one of the most interesting things on earth. They take and shoot, a, they do a magic trick, and when you hear action, you get to do that magic trick, try to do it flawlessly, and add something in the shot that makes it worth putting in the movie. It is a business of shooting shots, not of shooting movies. And I am, uh, and it doesn't matter. And we talked about that. It doesn't matter whether the movie is good or bad. You get a chance every single day that you're on a set to deliver several magic tricks. And, uh, and it's one of the great uh, jobs of all time. Masterclass part two. <laughs> and and all, I got to say, too. You know, of all the, uh, you know, I mean, I've been uh, a movie fan since I was old enough to watch them i don't think i've ever learned as much about the fine details that every actor must do in addition to giving an organic natural believable performance than what you just described and how you just laid that out so thank you for that and bravo you're a gent and, <laughs> and tasteful too well you know we take questions from here at the sag after foundation and um let's see kathy uh, has a question for you, and the question is, what was the most fun you ever had on a set, and why? I got off early one day. <laughs> That's, there's the reason right there. <laughs> now, you know, uh, it, it, there, it's a joy to be on a set, and, and as I just described, it doesn't matter how good the picture is. Uh, you get a chance to deliver your goods. You get a chance to express yourself. Uh, and uh, it is one of the great things to be able to express yourself. Not many people get to express themselves. Actors do on a, on a, whenever they can get a work, whenever they can get a job. 
and uh, and sometimes uh, getting jobs is thin. I, I can promise you that, as well we all know. Uh, but it is a joy to be on a set. I'm not sure that I've uh, that I can pick out one moment that was uh, so much better than any others. But I can promise you that even on dopey pictures, uh, you, you have a chance to deliver something really good, and uh, and it and you're you're filled with it uh, at the end of the day. The Listen, I, I know you answered a bunch of my questions early on, uh, but I just had some movies that you've done over the years that I just wanted to, if you just share like an anecdote, it could be anything. It could be how proud you are of the performance. It could be how much you love the director, or you love your co-star. Maybe the donuts and craft services were really great. Whatever floats your boat, but I did want to ask uh, uh, your something that comes to mind about 1969's Medium Cool. Medium cool. It was the third picture I did. And see, can I jump backwards a fast? Please. My first lesson about acting in front of a camera was from John Houston. Once I had explained to him that I hadn't made a movie, uh, and uh, and I said I will give you your money if, uh, worth if you hire me, uh, and uh, they hired me right away. I didn't know they worked that fast. But about a week later, the agents arranged a telephone call between me and this John Houston. I'm on the phone with him, and I say, uh, "Look, I appreciate the fact that you hired me, and I thank you very much." I said, "But do you remember I told you I never did a movie?" He says. I remember. <laughs> I said, well, um, um, uh, and reading my mind, he said, I'll give you some instruction. <laughs> True to form, I asked him every time I saw him until the very morning we started shooting, when he finally said to me, and I'm telling you, I asked him and I read the script and I begged him to give me, at the morning that we started shooting, he, uh, well, I got out of the car he said, now's the time, Bobby. I, she said, go take a look through the lens. I walked over to the camera. The cameraman stepped aside. I looked through the lens, and I turned back to Houston, and he said, you know how they hold their fingers? He said, those are the frame lines. Now, uh, those are the frame lines. I looked again, and I said, you mean that line that shows the cameraman what the audience sees? He says, those are the frame lines. Now, ask yourself this. What needs to be there? <laughs> he gave me the responsibility and the authority to put what was necessary inside the frame. When I got to medium cool, I realized that they do not always write it on the page. One day, in early on in the shoot, uh, Haskell Wexler said, all right, today we're going to shoot. I was playing a news cameraman. He said, today we're going to shoot an interview with a rich lady in a certain place. And I said, uh, and after a few seconds of, uh, I don't know that, that scene, I, I said, uh, have you got paper on that? He said, no, oh, no, 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 make it up. <laughs> That's when I realized that you do not always get it written out for you. And it gave me an opportunity, and I'm telling you, there were the movie script was this long. We shot that much. It was a lot of um, catch as catch can improvisation. I did a scene at the table where I talked to him about being a CYO boxer. The next thing I know, he said, we're going to work in a boxing gym. Uh, he created a, um, a rig that uh, so that he, he was a cameraman. He was a great cameraman. And he created a rig so that I could uh, hit, the, cam hit the, 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 the plexiglass. The camera was behind it. Uh, he made that day into something very interesting and very special. My, uh, uh, on that day, by the way... Um, Cassius Clay, he was Cassius Clay still, uh, walked up the, uh, walked that, that was his gym, uh, Muhammad Ali, but he walked up into that uh, fight gym in Chicago. Um, I mean, it's just one little moment of that movie. I said to him, uh, why don't you be in our movie? He said, hey man, if I'm in your movie, I'm going to have to get top billing. <laughs> Three and, to four. <laughs> true, yes. Um, but, um, but that was a movie in which I realized that they didn't always write it for you on the page and that you sometimes had to, and you had to bring a frame of reference to what you were doing so that in case there was a moment when there were no words written for you, you could, you know, continue it or start it. 
uh, and, uh, and it gave me great liberty. Once I started doing television, I realized they smack you when you do that. You must not, you know, we all know so television is different than movies. Uh, they, they make sure you do every syllable. You know, I was, t I was 10 years old in 1979, December of 1979, and I saw in theaters a movie that is still one of my personal favorites, a movie grand in scope, incredible special effects, an amazing score by John Barry. It is the first ever PG-rated Disney movie, and it is The Black Hole. The Black Hole was their last um, uh, low-tech movie. After that, Tron uh, started the um, the computer graphic generated uh, movies. Yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, and this was an old-fashioned um, movie uh, with old-fashioned effects. Uh, the 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 weightlessness were guys under the frame uh, on a teeter totter with the little guys uh, doing this below the frame so that it looked like they were uh, weightless and uh, wires and, and stuff like that. But I can tell you this, that when I first read it and recognized that the black hole was really 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, one of my favorite movies, uh, favorite stories ever, uh, the Jules Verne story, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, up in space. Wow. And I was getting to play the captain. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> oh, it was, it was a huge wow. Yeah. And, and uh, well, not, not that it's at all important, but they had us in a one-piece jumpsuit. Yeah. And they washed them every weekend. And every weekend they got, every Monday, they were tighter and tighter <laughs> and tighter. And so if you ever look at that movie again and you say to yourself, geez, what's that guy doing? Uh, you know, gaining weight or what? Uh, I can tell you that they finally had to make a second costume. But, I'm going home today and I'm watching it. <laughs> uh, that was the longest steady job I ever had. It, it, it shot for six months, exactly six months, 26 weeks. Um, and, um, and as I say, uh, uh, we never got a, a off Earth, but uh, we, uh, we were in a Disney stage for six months, seven in the morning till seven at night, exact, steady. Yeah. Maximilian's show was terrific. Maximilian was, was terrific. Uh, Borgnine was terrific. Yeah. Uh, Borgnine taught me a, num a lot of things, but you know, he was the kind of guy who, if there was something that needed doing, he grabbed it. He picked it up. He grabbed a, 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 a broom. This guy was, showed me what a really confident actor does. He does not uh, have only one job. He has any job that he can see that needs to be done. Yes, he was a, a fabulous guy. So you, you've talked about the ups and downs, you know, the lean times. When you went through that lean time before, before Jackie Brown, before Tarantino, before that diner meeting and that chat, how did you persevere? How did you, you know, may, did you ever get to a point where you say, yeah, maybe I'll switch careers? Like, how did you persevere and stay the course? Ah, uh, thank you. First of all, everybody here knows you learn how to hold your breath. You learn how to, uh, to uh, and there are only two rules of money. Rule number one, it doesn't matter how little you got, you can survive on it. Rule number two, it doesn't matter how much you got, you can spend it all and be in trouble. Everybody, doesn't matter what level you're at, has got the same floor and the same ceiling. you got to learn to hold your breath if you aren't getting work. I was at a point in my career, and it was more than 25 years ago, I'm sure, um, but about 25 years ago. It was before Jackie Brown. It was a few years before Jackie Brown, and I was walking into the uh, to Plummer Park on Fountain Avenue. Uh, I had stopped being a runner. My, uh, my knee was worn out. I've got a brand-new knee now, so, uh, but my knee was roughed up at the time, and I had been uh, hitting the ball just getting around on the tennis court just keep active and i was walking into Plummer park asking myself whether i was going to have to uh pick something new uh to do because i had four kids and uh and i wasn't working and uh and i didn't know how i was going to support them and i said to myself can you uh, can you find anything else to do that will uh that will support you and your children and uh and all the things that you needed to do 
And as I was walking in with the weight of the world on my shoulders, I stopped and I saw old Joe Stein hitting the ball. Joe was 79 years old, hitting the ball gracefully against the, the, the hard wall, and he was waiting for me. I, uh, uh, he was waiting for me, and I stopped in my tracks, and I said, that is the answer, Bob. Old Joe Stein never quits. He was still a psychiatrist, an actual psychiatrist. Guy still had patience. He still was writing books, and he could beat me at tennis. All I had to do was get the ball close to him, and he could put it anywhere on the court he wanted to. Never quit, Bob. You can win it in the late innings if you don't quit. I recognize that by seeing Joe Stein. And then the, this was an epiphany, by the way, something that happens that fast, but it takes me a long time to describe it. Don't quit. That's step three. Step two is when I said to myself, yeah, Bob, but how do you get to the winning it in the late innings? From the hole you're in, you're in a deep hole. How are you going to get out of that hole? And it came to me instantly. You just deliver the best you got right now. This is the only moment you have any creative control over. This is it. And if you deliver your excellent best right now, that will give you the best shot at the best future you've got coming. And we'll also, they always tell you you're going to get the reward of self-respect and satisfaction when you deliver your excellent best. And when I say excellent, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about, perfection is a sure loser, by the way, but your excellent best is within you. All you got to do is ask yourself to do the best you can right now. And when I re remind us actors of that we can do a lot of things at once, that's part of it. If you deliver your excellent best right now, that's step two. That will give you the best shot at the best future you got. And how about that good attitude you're supposed to have? Yes. So accept all things. That will give you a good attitude. It does not matter that you're get, not getting the good jobs anymore, Bob. It does not matter that you're not getting the Winnebago anymore, Bob. Uh, <laughs> does not matter she doesn't love you anymore, Bob. You accept what is and stop being mad about it and stop having negative feelings about whatever is. You accept what is. And now you are prepared with a good attitude to deliver your excellent best right now. And when you do that, you get that reward I keep talking about, the reward of self-respect and the reward of satisfaction. If you're looking for the good life, both of those are big components of the good life. And never quit, Bob. You can win it in the late innings. You can win it. <laughs> you can win it in the late innings. It's not over till it's over, but then it's really over. This is the moment you got. Deliver the best you got. That will give you a good shot. As with before, you skipped ahead to my next question, which was, what was the best advice you ever got? And ladies and gentlemen, that was it. sag Foundation honoring Robert Forster. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Robert Forster. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you so much, sir.